another book review. Uh, in this case, once again, getting caught up on the books for the Sword and Laser Book Club that I've read and haven't gone, gotten around to covering on the channel yet. In this case, talking about Sharp, talking about Cordelia's Honor, which is a omnibus volume containing the books Shards of Honor and Barriar. Normally, the Sword and Laser Book Club, when they do a omnibus book, they will take the first book out of the collection. So, for example, for the first big uh, Stormbringer omnibus, or rather, um, first big um, Elric Saga omnibus, they covered the first book in there, Elric and Melnibony, and didn't cover any of the later material, so we didn't get into stuff like, or rather they, I should say, didn't get into stuff like the, well, um, the kind of kickoff book that one of the, or the short story, I should say, that was published first, The Dreaming City. So, with this, however, with Cordelia's Honor, the two books in question, Shards of Honor and Barry, are originally written to be published together and then ended up getting published separately for a variety of reasons related to the publisher and other such stuff, and in the form of Cordelia's Honor, they were basically re-edited together as it was originally intended, so that's what I'm going with here. Now, with this in mind, I am going into this knowing that the Vorkosigan Saga is a big epic series of books with a whole slew of sequels, all many of which focused around child of the two main characters, Cordelia Naismith Vorkosigan and Errol Vorkosigan, one of which I've read already, um, which was the, and the title just blooped out of my head as I'm saying this, even with script outlines in front of me, uh, Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance. There we go. So, complete with knowledge of that, hey, the series goes on, and having read Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance already, that I'm like, okay, I know going in that there is a certain degree of it's going to work out going on here. So the question becomes, from my perspective, how do these two books hold up when there's only one destination that they can arrive at, or at the very least, where you know what the ultimate destination is going to be, that Miles Vorkosikin is going to be born? And the answer is, extremely well. The first half starts off with a sort of enemies to lovers story as Captain Cordelia Naismith of Beta Colony gets stranded on a world that she's surveying alongside the commander of a rival expedition, Errol Vokos, Admiral Errol Vokosikin of Barriar. They, um, Naismith got stranded because her expedition is attacked by some of Vokosikin's people when Vokosikin's political officer is attempts to assassinate him due to internal political complications on Barriar. The two of, them, the two of them then have to trek cross-country, bringing along a wounded member of Naismith's expedition until they can get to a supply cache for Vorkosigan expedition to try and get help, with the two coming to terms to, with feelings they have for each other over the journey. There's a time skip in the middle of Shards of Honor, where later on, carrying off of that previous story, uh, Barriar is invading a trading partner of Beta Colony, and Naismith is in command of a decoy mission to help get weapons through the blockade. It's successful, but she's captured, and she's on, Barbara, she's on the ship that Orkosikin is ostensibly in command of, but not in command of the whole expedition, and worst, the actual commander of this offensive is a depraved, sadistic scumbag. And they get out of the situation, there's various dramatic stuff that goes on back on Beta Colony with ties into Naismith coming to terms with her feelings for Errol and her ultimately deciding to defect to Barriar. That first part, generally pretty good. I do need to give a content warning for discussion of sexual assault in that first section and an, and an attempted sexual assault. But I think that first part holds up very, fairly well. There is some issue with... Ah, i put this gracefully. 
The second half of the book, because it one has because it was re this this was split up and the second part was published later, it's clear that the author, Lewis McMaster, Lewis McMaster Bojold, went through with a whole bunch of pass had an opportunity to go through with a few more passes on the second half of the book. But when these two were recombined together into a single book, he may not necessarily have had the opportunity to give the same treatment to Shards of Honor, or at least how I've read this, because I read these as the two separate volumes, Shards of Honor and Barriar, as opposed to the combined Cordelia's Honor book. So this leads to issues with the depiction of mental health and treatment thereof between the two. And to make a long story short, Bujold has improved tremendously in terms of how she writes about mental health and treatment thereof in by the time of Barriar is published as a standalone novel, but she's not quite there yet with Shards of Honor. And this comes to terms with the comes up with the depiction of mental health treatment in the first book. It feels like it is reflective of attitudes about the treatment of mental health in and mental illness in like the 1980s. It basically depicts as there like there's only one depiction of mental health care that is gotten into here. It's implied that Barriar has no treatment. And then Barriar and then Beta Colony has focused exclusively on the medical model, but to a degree where it is do where they're doing things that are abusive. Um like Naismith is basically put at risk of ha of getting um brainwashed. Like literally, like in the sense of having her memories tampered with by mental health care healthcare professionals to erase her feelings for Naismith because they believe that it's Stockholm syndrome. Um and that's what pushes her like that that's the final push for her to decide, okay, I'm leaving Beta Colony and I'm going to spend the rest of my life on Barriar with Captain with um Admiral Nace with Admiral Verkozikin and cut all my ties for my bridges, etc. And that's the impetus for that. And like you can't totally get rid of that because you need to have something beyond mm -hmm. because as far as for just like love is a powerful thing. I guess sir, and I suspect that. Bujold felt that it wouldn't fly in a speculative fiction novel to have someone throw away all their ties back home and go off to a country that you were previously at war with, like fairly recently at war with, all for the sake of love. That that's something where perhaps Bujold or her editor felt that, hey, this will fly in fantasy. Fantasy readers will buy this. Readers of speculative fiction will not, which is unfortunate. I have enjoyed reading some romanticy. I fourth ring was not my thing, but some other stuff I've taken a look at has been appealing. And would love to have some romance. I don't know what the, what the appropriate um, portmanteau would be for combining romance and uh, science fiction, but in either case, that I'd love to have, and certainly enjoy having some of that. But by having their particular first additional push be this, didn't quite work with me, and. And having the depiction of mental health for Beta Kali in the first half of the book be basically be like, there's no actually good version of mental health care that exists, or like Beta Colony is depicted as being in some respect, like politically um more enlightened than Beta than um Barriard's an actual democracy as opposed to a 
um, monarchy. Oh, yeah, it's depicted as being, like, we don't get into like sexual politics, but it's certainly depicted as being more enlightened in terms of gender politics. Um, women being able to hold any degree of job and hold and work in a particular position. Um, and I don't want to get into the trap of assuming that the views endorsed by the main character in any instances of science fiction are the views of the, of the author, but this is something that comes up a lot in science fiction writing as well. Um, this is one of the issues that comes up with Heinlein. This is one of the issues that comes up with, um, which, which can come up with Asimov. It is definitely something like there are multiple issues of science fiction writers where basically it's their writing, their, their world of that they've created in their science fiction is 100% reflective of their personal politics. And I don't want it, but I also don't want to, to assume that to be 100% the case either. Um, otherwise, like the first half, solid. And the step, the second half, though, is a tremendous improvement because the focus here is on Barriar. And I think part of the other issue here is we don't get a good look at Beta Colony societally and politically. Um, we spend very little time there, uh, before. Cordelia Bales, and by contrast, Barriar, the second half of the book, Barriar, is just on Barriar. We are spending our time there. We are steeped in the society. We are learning about the higher upper class portions of it because that's where the Vorkosikin family lives. Um, they are Vor, which is the upper class, the, the Vor prefix of the name. The way I would describe it is if they hadn't written it as Vorkosik in all one word, is you'd write it like Vor Kosikin, at the same way that you would see a um, surname of Va of Von, um, in like an Prussian noble name in works of historical fiction or that sort of thing, or Prussian or German. In that regard, similar sort of situation there, uh, and consequently. With the second half of Barriar, we are again we're strictly in 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 Barriar, and we are seeing the society from this outside perspective. On the one hand, um, this also gives us actually we're not going to. By the one hand, I'm not saying like saying this in the terms of contrasting. Let me back that up. First, this gives us a fully outside perspective. Um, Cordelia is coming in as a outsider. From Beta Colony. And so we are seeing this through her outside perspective. And she's she's approaching this from a I'm going to have to live here, so I have so I can't I can't just hate it. I have to come I'm going to have to come to embrace this in some degree or another. But there are things from Beta Colony society that she likes, and this in turn gives us in a weird way a tremendously better view of the entirety of beta colony and how it works society and a lot of the ways it works because we are hearing it from a native of that society and contrasted with Barry Aron society. And with that, we're also, we're, we're getting the noble perspective through Rokosikin house and Errol and his household, but we have members of the staff, which are not of the household, particularly in the case of Drew, who is the bodyguard for uh, Cordelia for a significant portion of the story, and then also with Sergeant Bothari, who came from a significantly lower class background. And so we have these contrasting perspectives of people from different walks of life, and we get to see the wider scope of society, and also because. Um, Cordelia is a outsider interact from a generally better off society, better off is not the best word, but a more enlightened isn't either a more politically equitable society 
than Barriar is, she is also able to recognize and highlight the inequities of Barriar in society with the treatment of Sergeant Bathari as someone who is explicitly described in the text as having schizophrenia, um, with varying degrees of him receiving treatment. The way that Errol is viewed when it is, comes up in the story that he's by. The way that Miles is talked about after partway through the story, Cordelia is attacked, or Cordelia and Errol are subject to assassination attempt. They are attacked, they are attacked with poison gas, and the impact of that attack is it means that Miles is going to have physical disability, have a physical disability. And Drew, Drew Snakobi, we have how oh, she's perceived from being a woman who wants to work in men's fields and in the terms of like soldiering and bodyguard and that sort of thing. And then let me look, check one thing real quick. Let me make sure I'm pronouncing character name correctly. And then also with, so, there we are, um, and with, uh, Sar and then with um, Lieutenant Kudelka, with him, because he receives a physical disability partway through the events of, Sh of Shards of Honor, and that comes up to the fore as he's a major supporting character in Bariar. We also see how disability is di is currently presented in and how people with disabilities are treated in current barrier in society, thus in turn giving a giving development into well, one, what is Miles going to end up facing when he grows up, not just in the terms of what he's currently receiving from his politically conservative grandfather but also later on as he gets older um just general stuff he's going to face as he's going through life and it gives a really good depiction i would say of all of these aspects and appropriately critical of them when it comes to like the the inequities of of Baryon society, which I think is significant because one of the issues we occasionally run into with military science fiction in general, particularly when coming to depictions of aristocratic societies, is there is a sense of not necessarily getting too critical. This is a problem which, for example, the Honor Harrington books get run into on a few on more than a few occasions. Um is we're not necessarily seeing these top seeing the wider picture of the various aristocratic societies and depictions there. This is also something that, like like to an extent we get a little bit of this with Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Like this is like this is a, a persistent background noise of military science fiction as a whole. Um some handle this better than others, but I really appreciate in this particular case, Bujol taking this basically big societal deep dive into Barriar and society. And we see its inequities in a lot of forms, both in terms of the just general like societal practices, but also like they're willing to be a certain degree representative of that there are appeals to living on barrier as well beta colony is a more hostile world to live on than barrier is and so things like wildlife and being out in open air and rain and all this that and the other thing are much more restricted and less available stuff like because resources are relatively scarce on beta colony um you like people are expected to get a parental license whereas anyone can 
have the kid at any time on Barriar if they want to. Um, and on, but on the other hand, a beta colony, they have birth control implants. And because related to this, they have birth control implants that people can turn off when they've gotten their license and have found a partner who they're going to have a child with and that sort of thing. And so consequently, their culture is in terms of sexual orientation significantly more enlightened to an extent also. Like the birth control implants aren't necessarily related to that, but in terms of like, it feels like not having that particular onerousness, like in terms of like obligations related to um, sex only for procreation um, and that sort of thing has allowed, like it, it's implied that from internal monologues of, of, of Cordelia, plus a little stuff I've seen about later where like, People being bisexual on beta colony or gay or trans or polyamorous is normal and acceptable and everyone's okay with that. That you had you can have engaged in ethical non-monogamy on beta colony and everyone's like okay. Whereas on very are there's a significant social stigma to that uh it's explicitly stated that there's a social stigma against um bisexuality that is used in an attempt to drive a wedge in cordelia and errol's marriage which doesn't work because again cordelia's a beta colony it's like oh you're trying to drive a wedge in my marriage by saying my by telling me my husband is bi and, it, and like it took her a second to like think it like it's very heavily, like almost explicitly stated, and then it takes her a minute to realize, oh, I'm supposed to, re I'm expected to react in a certain way to this, and I'm not doing that. Like, a really good character moment there. Um, and also a good, like, moment highlighting elements of Barriar in society. So, first off, also props to Bouchold for not engaging in bi erasure, which is something that, um, again, through various periods of fiction, like people have had problems with, like we're st still, it's still taken a bit for proper depictions of to get more depictions of like bisexuality in fiction. Um, and even then depictions of bisexual male characters is also still kind of scarce. So a props for that. Frankly, for having it be like, as far as these two books are concerned, one of the two leads even if it doesn't otherwise come up in the plot, like having one of the two leads be bi. Great. Um, makes for a really unintentionally appropriate choice for the book to be, for, for this to be my big book review for um, Pride Month. But in any case, uh, so otherwise, um, like disability representation is generally pretty good. Uh, I appreciate that they're not using for physical disability the full-on medical model. They're focusing more on when it comes to handling disability, pushing for social acceptance and the normalization of assistive technology, including the use of, including in some cases, violation of social mores regarding assist, um, assistive technology. Um, Cordelia gives... Um, Delka, a sword cane, a system with walking, which is normally something that he would not be permitted to use in Barriar in society because only a Vor can carry a, a sword cane. But like Errol and Cordelia, like, no, like he's been injured in the line of duty honorably. Um, and he is a vow, and as far as like, this is not just in terms of justifying to themselves, but justifying to society. This is a man that was honorably injured in the line of duty, and he is a valuable portion of, portion of her staff. So the sword cane is his standard issue equipment for his uh, position, so you can't deny him access to, deny him this valuable thing in this society where buildings aren't, de aren't designed to be handicapped and wheelchair accessible. So, 
like that that's great like I'm, I'm glad to see that disability representation there i'm glad to see um I, there's still some issue i it, there was a little bit of iffiness in the second half i would say about uh sergeant bothari and some of the elements of how his schizophrenia is handled but i'm not i'm autistic schizophrenia and unfortunately i don't have anyone else i know when i know who is to run past the work in terms of as a sensitivity sensitivity consultant is the wrong term but a uh, sensitivity co-reviewer like hey how is this how is this handled and certainly if I, I don't know if schizophrenia operates on a spectrum but there's also like, autism works on a spe spectrum schizophrenia might as also might also and again he's i also appreciate like in which lothari is schizophrenic but he's not paranoid schizophrenic oftentimes depictions of schizophrenia in fiction laser focus on paranoid schizophrenia and this isn't that um lothari's schizophrenia does tend towards the application of violence and favoring the application of violence but it's also implied that like as his own coping mechanism, he has directed himself into a profession where he can have controlled use of application or the application of violence is controlled. And thus he can work with that as a coping mechanism only for him to end up with um, a scumbag in the first, in a portion of the first, of shards of honor but otherwise being in the for Kosigan family um service for the rest of it which works out well and all i enjoyed these books uh i definitely get why this has led to such a significant series and i i'm certainly going to in the future read through the rest of the Vorkosigan saga, um, time permitting. It's, but yeah, like I, I'm glad I took the moment to, took this opportunity to go back to the beginning. When I read Captain Four Patrick's Alliance, I felt lost. I felt like, I mean, I knew I was jumping into the middle of the story, but I wasn't quite sure where to begin. And at the time, like, I want to say I was in either like senior high school or entering college like entering a, or going to college at that point and so i don't know how much resources there were for reading orders at that time but in any case i jumped in here and i think that was the right choice um i absolutely 100 percent enjoyed enjoyed this book and i am glad that i have that i read them or read these books and I definitely recommend. I will have links where you can get them in the doobly doo. Um, please, if you check checking anything or buying anything through those links, um, definitely helps and supports the blog. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.